Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Great. Let's go ahead and stand and, and sing together. We don't have a pianist this week. He is off on vacation, but we'll have him back next week. Anyway, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us online or joining us here in person. Let's go ahead and start singing. day and thank you for this time together that we've gathered together as a church to be in your presence no matter where our presence is that you would be here with us and thank you so much for your presence and for these people that are joining us lord in your name we pray amen amen god bless you okay everybody give everybody a high five i know air five air five it's good to see all it's good to have you here uh you are welcome to come in and join in live person here with the many of us that are here we got everything set up there's uh if, if people are comfortable we got an overflow room for them but uh you know it is a joy to see people coming and and getting back involved in 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 fellowshipping together and if if, if you need me you can join us virtually uh, and uh, keep up with what God is doing. And he is doing some wonderful and great and amazing things. And we rejoice in him. 
because that's where our joy needs to be placed because he is the very fountainhead of all joy. We are here today. We want to welcome you. We pray that God is able to bless you through what he has for us today as we worship together in song and worship around the word of God. So uh, I, with that being said, with everybody be what, it's good to see you all and you're going on vacation next week. Yeah. So Rob's going to slip from the back to the front, right? That's right. All right. Let's go for it, guys. I think you guys would rather be without me than without Isaac, because, man, <laughs> just the guitar is just, oof. It's, I'm not a guitarist. All right. Let's go ahead and keep singing. You can stand if you want. Um, we're going to sing I Stand Amazed. So I like to stand when I sing that one, because I'm standing amazed. But you do what you want. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me he took my sins and my sorrow and he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be Give hope, you re- 
restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out Shout your praise. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. instruments just our voices I love you Lord and I lift my 
Father, we praise you and we lift up our voices to your name and we ask that you would just bless the rest of this service and every person here. In your name we pray. Amen. Great job, guys. Thanks. Thanks so much for being so faithful. And thank you all for being here this morning. It's good to see all of you out there. And, uh, you know, God is, is so good, so wonderful, so great, so gracious, and what a great week he has given us, and what a great day. You'll see that the title up there is A Peace That Passes All Understanding. I think many of you know where that reference comes from, and uh, so it might give you an idea what we're going to be looking at today, uh, because I, uh, not only because it comes at a time in, in our text, if you go to Hebrew or uh, Philippians chapter, I, forgetting where I'm at, Hebrews, Joshua, you know, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4, and you're going to find our text there this morning. But, uh, you know, uh, many of you uh, have faced, or at least you know people that have faced uh, a great deal of difficult circumstances, uh, uh, lately especially, that may have robbed them of a great sense of peace and security. I've spoken to a great number of people over the last several months, uh, both believers and those who are not yet believers, uh, uh, over, over the course of this time, who are living in incredible fear and anxiety. It seems to be uh, raising to epidemic portions. I, I know people who are afraid to venture outside their homes, get outside their door to interface with anybody unless there's a barrier. Uh, uh, I mean, and not just social distancing, I mean a barrier between them and, and somebody else because of the, the, the fear that is instilled within them. Uh, many people listen to the TV and they watch all of the things that are going on and I get calls from people who literally are not able to sleep because of the things that are going on. Their, their, their souls are troubled. They're deeply disturbed. They're, they're terribly frightened. They're living in anxiety. I was reading one report and talking to some uh, uh, people that work in, in, in the areas I do with chaplaincy and uh, they work on the mental health side of things and, and what they're talking about is uh, what they're seeing uh, as, as a, uh, a, a great problem, an incredibly increasing problem through this uh, 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 quarantining and social isolating that, that are keeping people from being in contact and being in touch with people and they're saying it's causing a great problem. We've seen a great uptick in uh, attempted suicides and suicides and, and people going to the hospital with suicidal ideations. And it's all being traced back to the fact that, uh, you know, we were made to be connected to people. When you disconnect from people, then, then there's a lot of other problems that, uh, that arise become of, uh, because of it. Uh, there's an increase in insecurity in our day. You know, I find, however, that uh, no matter what's going on, there is a lot of opportunity that you and I have out there to, uh, to lose that uh, sense of inner peace, that sense of security and calm that we have, that, that sense of inner well-being. But I also have found out that our outlook often determines the outcome on these things. Uh, I would share with you that uh, Sherry and I moved uh, here in the kids in uh, 1990, and we moved from really... Uh, a, a magnificently rugged, beautiful area of Arizona. Uh, you guys were familiar with it. We were just south of the uh, petrified forest. And uh, for some people, they may say, oh, that, that, that's not pretty. But it is so rugged. And the plateaus and the stuff out there, it is, it is beautiful on the other, other side of the White Mountains. But one of the things that uh, what was so amazing in that area is uh, during this time of year especially, the incredible electrical storms that we'd see. 
the, uh, the lightning storms, the thunderstorms. They were amazing. Our friends that live out of town uh, on their, their house, they live on kind of a hill and there's a little, and, and the lightning fight would be so great that the clap of thunder would be, you know, right on top of the, the, the lightning. I mean, you were that close. In fact, their neighbor's house was struck, struck they had several lightning rods around their place because it had been struck in the construction several times by lightning. But uh, it, it's a magnificent light show if you were ever to be able to see something like that. And uh, it, it, it can be pretty frightening as well. They're majestic. They're incredible. But they can certainly rob you immediately of that inner peace. You can be sitting there doing nothing, and all of a sudden that bolt of lightning goes across that first one, and you'll come up out of your chair about like that. Your hair stands on. Well, I like my hair standing up anyway, so that, you know, that's okay. Uh, but uh, but you know, I read a story that goes right along these lines that, uh, that, that I can identify with, my family can, because we used to love to sit out there and watch the, well, some of us watched, some of us hid behind couches. But, uh, you know, at any rate, one night uh, there was a violent thunderstorm uh, with a flashing of, of, of lightning and the peals of thunder, the rumbling and all that goes with it. And it was one of those uh, terrifying storms that, uh, that caused people to immediately begin to tremble and lose that sense of peace and security that comes with it. Well, when it hit, suddenly, you know, the, it flashed brightly through the house and it, and it clapped. And, and as the thunder was, was settling down, the, the dad heard a, a real high-pitched squeal coming from the second floor. And uh, all of a sudden, as parents do, when uh, uh, you think there may be some trouble or something, you'd be kid counting noses and uh, make sure everybody there. And he noticed that their four-year-old daughter was nowhere to be found. Another clash of lightning and, and, and thunder roared, and he heard this squeal again. So he knew it was his four-year-old. So he ran as fast as he could up the stairs and down the hallway to his daughter's room, and he threw the door open. And, uh, and, and, and he sees her spread eagle on the window pane, standing on the windowsill like this. And he yelled through the thunder and lightning. He said, what are you doing? And she turned around with a big smile on her face, a real squeal of enjoyment. She said, look, Daddy, God's trying to take my picture. <laughs> Don't you love it? Don't you love it? God's trying to take my picture. Is that how you see things? Look back over the last few months of your life, there are times of unease, there are times of fear, the disquietness within your soul. And do you see it? God's just taking your picture. Maybe that flash of lightning is coming along and God's saying, I'm just trying to get your picture. When the flash of adversity comes and it catches you, will it catch you with a grimace? Or will it catch you with a smile? Because deep within your heart you have this lasting, incredible peace. Father, I pray that as you work through each of us today to accomplish your purpose laid down from the foundation of the world, that we will come before you in humble adoration because you are supreme and holy. You are our sovereign and Lord. You, you set enthroned above the very circle of this earth and we praise you. And as your children, we come and sit at your feet in adoration and love and pray, Lord God, teach us today and give within us a willing heart to hear and respond and obey you. May you be glorified in this, our gift to you, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text today is one of the better known passages in Scripture. We looked at it a bit last week, and I thought, well, we'll just pass on by. But I just couldn't pass on by it any longer. I needed to settle down just one more time in these two verses, well, in these verses in Philippians 4, primarily verses 6 and 7. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There you have it. 
right? We've got it, don't we? It's certainly easy enough. Prayer plus thanksgiving equals what? Peace. Say it with me. Prayer plus thanksgiving equals peace. Okay, go through the steps. You got it. Now you have peace. Prayer plus thanksgiving equals peace. Now you have peace. It's kind of like reading the instructions on a shampoo bottle, right? Squirt a bit in your hand, apply it to your hair, work up a lather, rinse, repeat. Correct? I mean, that's the formula for using the shampoo. Read the bottle sometime. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think there has to be instructions on a shampoo bottle? <laughs> Probably because somebody didn't know that they had to put it in their hands, apply it to the hair, work up a lather, and rinse it off. And they probably sued the company because the company didn't give them adequate instructions on how to apply and, and work up a lather and rinse it off and then repeat. And then I knew the guy that got a bottle of shampoo. He read the instructions and he spent there all day until the bottle of shampoo was gone. Just rinsing, you know, sudsing, rinsing, repeat. Sudsing, rinsing, repeat. No? Okay. But isn't that the way we are? We're a formula-driven people. Then... What happens when the formula doesn't work? When I'm anxious, I pray. But my mind keeps drifting back to the anxious circumstance that created the problem. And before I know it, I'm no longer praying. I'm trying to solve the problem. Been there? Uh-huh. Again, I confess my distractibility, right? And I get back on track, I pray, and, 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 uh, and the cycle begins again. But in the midst of my prayer, all of my problems begin to flood in. My prayer is crowded out, and the problems are there. And, it, Pastor, it doesn't work. Okay, here's what I need to do. I need to add thanksgiving to that. Okay, I had the prayer. Now let's add the thanksgiving. So I'm going to make me a big thanksgiving list. And I'm going to go down all the things that I'm, 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 uh, I'm thankful for in, in, in order that it might dislodge the anxiety of my life, right? No, because about the time you start going through that list, all of the problems keep coming back and you start feeding into all the doomsday scenarios and then where are you? Apply a dab in your hand, work up a lather in your hair, rinse, repeat. Now what? I've tried the classic passage of Scripture, Pastor. I did exactly what the formula said, right? And it doesn't work. Well, there's a clue. The clue is you're looking for a pill. The clue is you've run to God, my pharmacist, and said, give me a pill for my anxiety. Give me a formula for my anxiety. But i got to tell you, that's not the way Scripture works. And I should have noticed it when I reduced this passage to a simple formula. Anytime you reduce the Word of God to some simple formula, you're going to miss the point of what's being said. So what is the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, and how do I attain it? Well, in Philippians 4, 7, we say we have this wonderful problem. The problem is the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, what's important to note is that it is the context of the promise. Because, you see, we, we come here and we find the, the condition, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. God's peace is promised to guard those who pray with thanksgiving and, and uh, about everything. And this peace tra transcends our ability to understand it. You see, there's a lot of things, a lot of gifts that God gives us that are beyond our very comprehension. For example, the gift of salvation is indescribable, isn't it? Isn't that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 15? Thanks be to God for his what? Indescribable gift. Try to completely describe uh, the, the, the joy and, 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 and everything that you get in salvation. It's impossible. You can go on and on and on. Uh, to complete uh, to, the complexity 
and the wisdom of God's plan is totally inscrutable. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How many of you can figure God out? This good friend of ours that, that, that I told you uh, uh, lived out of town, he, he had many friends of a different faith, and they thought that probably because he had so many kids, a big, uh, a, a big place, and he, he grew a garden, he ought to be part of them. And he said, I, I can't be part of you. Gotta be, and he said, why? He said, because you got God figured out. You put him in a box, and you got him figured out. He said, my God is a lot bigger than it will fit into your box. You see, we can't. Who can fathom? Who can comprehend God? We can't. How many of you have been God's counselor? Well, I've tried on multiple occasions with great failure. The love of Christ can never be fully understood. This is what Paul is writing to the, the church in Ephesus in chapter 3, verse 19. And, and if you read that whole section, and I only picked out a part, he said, may we know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. He wants us to know that which we can't know. <laughs> I love that. But I'm not going to get into that. Because like I said, our human reasoning is incapable of fully comprehending the peace of God. Why? Because the peace of God is not a what, it is a who. It is a person. And when we reduce this down to a formula, we miss the essence because the essence is it's about a person and not a formula. If you're going to Scripture as a formula to ease your anxiety, you're going to miss the point because where you need to be going is to a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. After all, isn't one of his blessed names that of the Prince of Peace? In Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. On that morning that Christ was laid in a manger and the angels busted out of heaven and announced to the shepherds when they said peace on earth, goodwill to man, they're claiming the fact that peace literally was born into the earth when Jesus came. The peace you search for, that inner contentment comes from a relationship with, with God. It's about knowing and trusting a person and our formulas can actually turn us away from that person and cause us to rely on a series of steps instead of relying upon God. What is your focus when you go to him and bring your, 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 your supplications, your requests, your prayers with thanksgiving? What's your focus? Getting all of this out? Or is your focus on the one who sits upon the throne of heaven? Who will meet you at the throne of grace and provide help for you in your time of need? Who's going to meet you? A formula? No. It is Christ that is going to meet you. So where's your focus when you go there? Avery Willis helped me a number of years ago in the area of quiet time. I don't know how many of you have ever struggled having a consistent and regular quiet time. And that's because I had all the plans out there, and I followed all the plans the way they ought to be followed. I mean, I set my alarm. I did all of these things. Everything the plan said I should do, I did. And Avery looked at me and said, well, that's your problem. He said, you're committed to a plan and not to a person. He said, why don't you start focusing on who you're going to meet not what you're going to do when you get there. Made all the difference in the world. When I go down to that little corner of mine, I know that I'm, I'm going to meet with a person. I'm going to meet with the most powerful person in the universe. The most loving person that there ever existed. I'm going to meet with a person. Do you, do you approach your time alone with God that way? I'm meeting with you. 
You see, when that shifted, what ends up happening is the plan gives way. Okay, God, here's what I need to tell you. And I get, begin telling God everything he needs to know about my life and everything. And, and, and all of a sudden, you see, it, it's all about me and what I need. You know, it's all about the plan. When I come and say, okay, God, it's all about you. I need to hear from you. And in the process of that hearing and dialogue, all these things that are on my list, they just end up going to it. The believer who places his or her confidence in a loving God and not a formula and is thankful in every circumstance will possess a supernatural peace and inner contentment that the world can never, never understand. Peace is a person. And the faithful believer who knows peace and in their heart and mind they know they are guarded by it, Despite the raging tempest that's roaring, he or she can smile, hold their arms out because they know in the flash of tribulation, God is simply taking their picture. And when that picture develops, you'll look a little more like the master. Take a shot, God. Snap the picture. No one, especially those outside Christ, will ever be able to fathom that kind of peace. So what does the passage tell us that, that we need to know about the promise of peace that is surely ours? Well, I've got to tell you, before I, I, I share a few things with you, Paul says later in verse 9, he sums this whole thing up powerfully. He says, the things that you've learned and heard and seen and practiced and, and, and seen in me, in, in me, practice these things. Then what does he say? And the God of peace will be with you. Do you see it? If you have the God of peace present, you have the peace of God. Guarding. Your focus will determine your outcome. Who are you focused on? Well, the first thing I want you to see you know, in this is, is what he says. The Lord is, is near. You see, there's a command there. Be anxious for nothing. And typically, when you read something, the reason why you should not be anxious you know, those things usually come after me, and then, then these things are listed. However, in this case, the reason is slipped into the preceding verse when he says, let your gentle spirit be known to all, the Lord is near. That changes everything for me. The emphasis is not on how we pray it is on the God who is close, the God who hears, the God who is with me. The focus is on Emmanuel. He is near, therefore, don't be anxious for anything. Do you see the connection? The Lord is near. Now, now, some commentators would tell you he's talking about the imminent return of Christ, and, and, and others would say, well, he's talking about the, the nearness, the you know, Emmanuel in us. And I think he's talking about both. But the thing that most directly affects me today, right where I live, is the fact that God is near. Emmanuel is God with us. He is with us. He is in us. He is near. Therefore, be anxious for nothing. But with everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. It changes everything. The only thing that could ever separate us from the love of God is the presence of sin. Is that not right? And friends, the presence of sin, sin has been dealt with at Calvary. So what's going to separate you? What's going to put a barrier between you and God? Paul says nothing. Isn't it true that the, the presence of another person really in a frightful situation helps? I don't know how many of you have ever been in an emergency room because a loved one was taken to an emergency and you're sitting there fretting and all of a sudden a friend comes and you feel, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. 
Years ago when I was in college and trying to earn a living and there wasn't a lot of jobs around, I took a job that my father said he would raise from the grave and kill us if we ever did. My dad had been a miner for years and he said if we ever, were, if we ever went into a mine, he would, he would kill any of us that ever went into a mine. Well, that was the only job I could find. And I got a job and uh, I, I, I worked in a coal mine. Uh, well, that's a misnomer. I spent a few days in a coal mine. About the second time that we had a problem in the coal mine where we had a whole bunch of slag and, and, and rock tumbled out and rock the, the, the way it had became, I was in a, a, a minor cave-in inside the mine. And when I opened my eyes and cleared the, the dust, and of course it's, it, it's real foggy out there, and I remember distinctly the great panic rising up within me. One of my fears had always been being buried alive anyway, so this was a real panic for me. And all of a sudden, I felt an arm reach out and touch me and say, it's okay, son, calm down. It's all going to be okay. We'll be out of here in a minute. I can't tell you the amazing calm, because this was a guy that, that had spent 30 years working in mines, and, uh, and you know, he, he just had such a voice of confidence and calm that it calmed me. And when they did open up the space and we got out within a half hour and, 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 and I, I got up and I got out of that hole and it, it was a bright sunshiny day outside Gunnison, Colorado. It was a little cold, but that was okay. I looked back and said, mail me my check and I just kept walking. <laughs> but the presence of that one individual, that reassuring touch, that calm voice in the midst of my terror changed everything everything. Fear doesn't want a series of impersonal steps. Fear wants a person. And if we are confronted by the presence of, uh, comforted by the presence of a mere human being who is far less strong or brave perhaps than we are, but it brings comfort and call to us, how much more will we be comforted by the sworn presence of the reigning Christ. This is the path toward peace and comfort. Set your fix, your gaze, your meditation upon Emmanuel. It means God with us. Remember how the spirit of Jesus has been given to us. He says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be afraid. You ought to take the challenge sometime, open up a concordance and see how many times you're told not to be afraid and to be of courage. We are looking at Joshua on the, on, on, on the morning studies, and you see there, there's four times in the first chapter that, that God tells Joshua, you know, be not afraid, be, you know, be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, I'm going to be, and the promise is where, where, where you go, I'm going to go with you. He's not limited to a single body or, or a single vine to a, a, a single place. He is everywhere present. He is in you right now. And you need not fear. Second, he provides an abundance of grace. So, so what is it he's going to do with us? Will he give us the money to, to get out of the problem or zap the person that, uh, that wants to harm us or keep our kids from getting an accident? And the answer to that, not always. Not always. His presence and his action in your life may come differently than you hope or you expect, but it will always be the right thing when it comes. We know that bad things happen even to the people of God. So what difference does God's presence mean then? Although he is an almighty God, he doesn't always use his almighty power the way we think he ought to do it. We feel like we are... Uh, Left where we start, you know, trusting in, in certain steps and, and, and hope that, that, that we'll, we'll, we'll somehow make peace. So there's got to be more, and there is. There's always more. First, we, we should understand that when God says he's present, 
or that he hears or that he sees that, he's, that he really is doing something. He's not being passive. You know, when you and I say, oh, we'll pray for you, sometimes we make that a passive statement, don't we? Well, I'll pray for you. And we get busy with our day, we forget to pray for him. We make it a, when God says, I'm there, it's not a passive statement. It means he's doing something. He's always working for our good and his glory. Second, what he's doing is this. He's giving us exactly what we need when we need it. He tells us as much in the Sermon of the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, your father knows what you need. Verse 8, he says, your father knows what you need before you ask. And then he goes on in verses 25 to 33 to tell us something about it. Listen to this. For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you eat or what you drink, nor your body as to what you'll put on. So he says, stop fretting. Stop worrying about things that, uh, that you don't need to be worrying about. He goes on and says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He's saying, believer, don't be like everybody else in the world. If you're fretting about these things, you're doing exactly what you're not yet believing friends are doing. You're acting just like they are. And it shouldn't be this way. We're different. We have something different. Then he goes on to explain what our real priority ought to be. In verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Where's your focus? What you're seeking? So this tells me that God knows what I need, and he knows when I need it. So in all reality, it's in his hands, and I can rest confidently with the assurance that God's got it all in control. So I can sleep at night. In the New Testament, he says that he will give us grace. If we ever need to to face anything, there will be an abundance of grace in order to do it. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, he says, My God, or he said, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in everything, you will have an abundance for every good work. Now, you want to tell me the superlatives in there? Tell me what God is holding back. You see, there are times when we will feel destitute and like we're wandering in a wilderness without food or water and then all of a sudden the manna of God's grace comes down and we feast. The grace comes pouring out of the rock and we drink. You see, God is right there in the middle of every situation and circumstance that you and I go through. Charles Frey Fry in his uh, in, in the third stanza of, of of the great song Lily of the Valley, and many of you know it. He said, "He will never, never leave me, or yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me; I've nothing now to fear. From His manna, my He, my hungry soul shall fill." Then he goes on to say, "And sweeping up to glory, to see His blessed face." Where the rivers of delight shall ever be. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. You see, God's abundant grace is sufficient to meet the challenges that I'm going to face or you're going to face today or tomorrow or any time through the week. So if you're feeling weak and your heart is trembling, you see, that's when God's grace is most visible. Paul testifies to this, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Is his grace sufficient for you? Well, it is. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Do you feel weak? Do you feel like you have no control over certain things? That's when his grace is most sufficient. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well uh, content with weakness, with insults and distress and persecutions and difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am made strong. Why? Because Paul just wrapped the fragile string of his life around the unbreakable cord of Christ. And Christ makes him strong. So don't worry about tomorrow because God has promised you all the grace you're going to need to get there. Smile. 
God's taking your picture and he's simply developing it into his likeness. But there's a third thing I'd like to share with you. Turn loose and turn over. Hope and peace don't come without a fight, people. It just simply does not. God is pleased to work hope and peace within us, but it will always build gradually within us. When we, 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 we come then to, we, we meditate on, we feed upon the Word of God, we feed upon Christ, and we keep calling out for the grace that is necessary for the day. And it is always there. And it is there, and then we are growing stronger in, in that relationship. The kingdom of God advances through weakness and dependence upon the King, and not through quick and bloodless victories. Paul tells us where to turn and what to do. He says, be anxious for nothing in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. You see, that does what we have here. Turn loose and turn over. The act of taking everything to God in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving means that we are emptying ourselves of these concerns. We're turning loose of them. We're turning them over to Him and bringing them to the only one who can do anything about it. But let me give you a picture here, people. Simply put, I cannot grasp the one thing that I need the most when I have other things in my hands. I remember, I, I love movies, and, and I saw, uh, it, was a, it was a crash, and a rescue copter came over, and they're letting down the line, and this guy has, uh, he has a, a bag in his arms that he's holding on to because he'd embezzled money, and he's, and he's hanging on to that. And they're pleading with the guy to, to, to grab the lifeline. But you see, in order to do, grab the lifeline, what is he going to do? He's got to turn loose of what he's holding on to. He drowns. Because he won't turn loose and take a hold of something. How many of us drown day by day, figuratively speaking, because we're just hanging on to that stuff? When the abundance of God's grace is out there and say, grasp it. My grace has grabbed you, now grab a hold of it and hang on. See, I can't hang on if i got a lot of other stuff in my hands. The only way to do is to let go and turn it over to a sovereign God. You say, oh, I do that, but then I go back and pick it up. Well, then you get, you, 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 you know, you got to let go. People, I, I don't know any other way to say it until you're willing to let go you'll not know the lasting peace that is there for you. If you find that you're feeling a bit weak, you're probably on the right trash, track. Essential to this battle with fear and anxiety is a gift of humility. In our, anxious, in our anxiety, we usually concern, are, are concerned about a, a lot of other things, the things that we love and the things that we want to control and the things that we want to hold on to. What we want, what we, what, what we want to take, what we want is the things that matter to us. That's what we hold on to, isn't it? In order to turn loose of those, we have to give up our attachment to those things. Listen, I use a simple illustration. I used to smoke four and five packs of cigarettes a day when I was younger. Light one right after the other. I love those things. I mean, I loved them. In fact, I can tell you it's been oh, lots of years. I was 25 when I quit. And there are still times that I think, ooh, ooh. But you know, I wanted something more in my life. And I put them down like the poison they were. You see, if we start seeing the things that we're grasping that we love so much as poison, we might be willing to lay a few things down. 
We want to take matters into our own hands. We want to protect our own future. But we're finding that it's impossible to manage all the possible contingencies. And we get anxious. We want to protect our little kingdoms, don't we? But when it's our kingdom, it's our responsibility. No wonder we get anxious. Find anxiety in your life and you'll often find an agenda in your life or something in your life that's more important than God. Now, here's how the Apostle Peter helps us to think. In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. He's asking you to simply do one thing. Humble yourself before God. Humility is submission. This means that the mere information and knowledge will not bring me peace. So we must therefore respond to what we hear with humility and trust. You're God. You're sovereign. I'm not. One last thought before I finish. And that is pursue peace for God's glory. We all know that peace, true peace, is something that is elusive in this world. In fact, Jesus never promised us peace. In fact, he promised that we'd have tribulation. And that's why the peace that passes all uh, uh, comprehension, the peace that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, passes all understanding is so vital in the life of the believer. Because, you see, it becomes the, one of the greatest platforms that you and I have to raise up the billboard to the glory of God. When all else is failing around you, when everything is crumbling around and you stand upon the firm rock of Christ and you're clinging on to him and by grace, you stand in that unbelievable peace that only comes from that relationship with God and that surrender to him. The world looks and they wonder why. Let me tell you, folks, the world is looking today right now like they've never looked in my lifetime. Their worlds are clumbering apart and they're wanting to know, is there anything stable out here? And it is time for the church to rise up. It's time for believers to stand up and say, yes, there is. My life is no different than yours, but I stand in the peace of Almighty God. So in the world where true peace seems to be impossible, you and I become ambassadors of peace. The world depends on having favorable circumstances if they're to have peace. If things are going well, then they have peace. If they're not, then they don't have. And Jesus made the distinction between the peace of this world and the vacillating peace that they have in ours. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world give I you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Therefore, it's incumbent upon all of us who would follow Christ to pursue peace. That means that I have to be proactive about it. I have to be intentional. Psalm 34 verse 14 says, depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. And the writer of Hebrews, you know, says in Hebrews 12 and verse 14 and 15, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. I, 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 I'd bring us full circle at this point and bring you to remembrance that, that what I said earlier, to pursue peace is to pursue not something but someone. Do you pursue Christ? You see, seeking peace is, is, is in reality seeking Christ who is the peace, Prince of Peace. Who do you seek? Who do you seek in these times of trouble? In the circumstance or situation that you're in. But this one thing I add to it all, pursue peace, pursue Christ. It's not casual, it's not passive, it is intentional what are you doing to intentionally 
pursue him. You won't be able to do it with your hands full of a lot of other stuff. Are we actively, intentionally seeking Christ with all of our being? Or do we figure that somehow or other it'll just happen? Because if you think it will just happen, I give you the answer, it won't. You must pursue Christ. Depart from evil, do what's good, seek peace, and pursue it. Would you bow your heads? As the guys come, you're here today or you're listening in. Are you living in that peace that surpasses all comprehension? Or are you living in a constant turmoil of the present? Christ's invitation to all is to invite you into love, into his peace, through a very simple, straightforward process. The simple repentance or a turning from sin and self and toward faith in Christ. A simple owning up to our sin and rebellion against God and desiring that change that only he can bring. And then believing thoroughly within our heart that God's Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, came and bore my sin upon the cross, bore your sin upon the cross. He died for your sin. He paid your penalty. He died and was buried and rose again on the third day. And in, invite Him into the life. Surrender up to Him. Give Him your life. Just ask Him, save me, Lord. And take control. You're a believer here today. You're a believer out there. But you find that your life is swirling and in turmoil because of all the things that are going on and all the things that are happening. And you find that peace has been elusive even for you. I invite you. Stop looking for him in a formula. Pursue him. What do you get in your hands? What are you holding on to? What are you grasping that keeps you from being able to reach out and grasp a hold of the grace that God has so abundantly provided you? As we stand, we bow our hearts before him. If there's a decision that you need to make, I pray that you make it. If you need to respond, I give you that opportunity to respond. There's a response card. You can catch me at the door. You can send me an email. We want to be responsive to what God's doing in your life. Father, we ask you to work in our hearts the very grace that you have provided. In Jesus' name, amen. Savior 
the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion me as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set see all of you here this morning. Those of you who are first timers, welcome. We, we love the fact you're here. I pray that God has been able to bless you. If you're first time out there, we say the same thing. Please respond to us. Let us know, if, especially if this is your first time and you like to be added maybe to our uh, email list. If you know people that would like to be, uh, if you can get me their email address, uh, just send it to our, our my email address on our webpage. I will get it. I'll add it to the list. They'll get the listing guides and other things that we send out. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. If God is doing something, we really, really do want to hear it. So uh, if, if you've accepted Christ, maybe recently or maybe today, or you're inquiring about coming into a relationship with him, please contact me. I'll get back with you immediately. There's been other people that we've been able to, to help, and we've been able to point them to a church where they are in their local area and other states. But uh, God is blessing. So uh, thank you all. May God bless you. As, the, as uh, the team sings us out this morning, make sure you love one another. And it's good, so good to have you all together. What a great crowd. We love you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, guys. You're dismissed.
Father, hold me, hold me. 